present from today? Uh, uh, so first of all, what is a graph? Uh, since you're coming to a math meetup, I imagine you've heard the word graph before, but uh, just to remind you, graphs consist of dots and lines. Dots, lines. Line graph. Or People at the math pie, meetup have probably also graph. heard of lines. <laughs> yeah, oh, we should have a whole discussion. <laughs> now, now we have to or debate you and tell you that those are not lines. lines. <laughs> they are line segments. All right. Yes, <laughs> uh, they're not line segments either. <laughs> uh, uh, they are as big. They, they yeah. are continuous images of compact real intervals. Ooh. Okay. Okay. Uh -oh. <laughs> uh, so, so yeah. <laughs> there's a lot of uh, extra things you can add to graphs, uh, like these colors and uh, edge weights and directions to the edges. I'm not going to do any of that. Uh, well, they're really color, but not for this reason. Uh, so yeah, that's a graph. Uh, we're particularly interested today because that's what the paper is about in uh, connected components of graphs. So this is not a very good example because all of these graphs are connected. So let me give you a slightly different Is it example. all of the graphs are connected? Or all is it all one, one graph? Ah, uh, <laughs> all the same, so it's going to be the same. Yeah. <laughs> I think that I can make like, the simplest possible example. So if you have a graph that has like, three nodes, three vertices, and edge there, and that's it. And the connected components, the parts of it that are connected. Yeah, this is one of them, and this is the other one. Hey, components. Largest pieces of subpieces of the graph, which are all connected to each other, are all all reachable from one another. Nothing that has nothing to do with how you draw it. So you might think that's connected. Actually, this is two connected components. One of them is those four edges, and the other one is these two. Yeah, I, mean, just, I just drew it pretty badly. So it goes. So uh, connected components are the kind of the topic of this paper. Uh, the other important feature here is random graphs. So in a random graph, you, uh, you don't just start with a picture like this. You start, well, there's many models, but uh, the one we'll be using is you start with some number of vertices that you've chosen in advance and a probability. And then you go through all the edges that could be there, all the like, uh, entries to edges that could be there. And for each one, you independently decide with that probability whether to include that edge or not. Uh, so this is a random process, and its output is a graph. So we call that a random graph. Uh, the uh, obviously, you cannot say a lot that's very definite about a random graph. It could happen that it's totally disconnected. Right? You happen to roll the dice in such a way that you never get an edge. Uh, or it could be all the edges are there just by chance. Uh, but what we can do is make statements of uh, what these guys called typically, typically, uh, which really mean, what, or in fancier terminology, uh, with high probability. So we'll show that things happen with a probability that when n is large, it is close to 1. So kind of more or less certainly, virtually certain, <laughs> more or less, at least when n is large. So it'll be some function of n, but the probability that the thing happens will be some function of n, and that function will go to 1 as, uh, as n goes to infinity. All right, uh, so the particular thing that we're going to talk about is the size of the largest uh, connected component in the graph. Let me actually skip the abstract here and just go to theorem 1. Here's theorem 1. And let me get this a little bigger so that you can uh, read it. This is uh, theorem one. A little bit casual with a couple of things and ways that are standard in, uh, like in analysis and this kind of common torts. Uh, like they say small enough, and they're not going to say exactly what that means. It's just like you're supposed to read the proof and figure out like at each point that they assume that epsilon is smaller than something you should make a note. Right? And then <laughs> at the end you collect all those notes and you figure out how small epsilon has to be. They don't want to do that work, so they just say small enough. <laughs> Uh, but it's kind of a warning that in the proof they're going to uh, uh, they're going to be just assuming all the time that epsilon is small whenever they need to. <laughs> and I'll come back to that later. This is uh, just the statement that I said where you have uh, uh, the way we construct a random graph is by taking n vertices to begin with and then taking the edges with probability p. So as g is a random graph, random variable graph value, random variable uh, whose distribution is this, and that's what that means. Uh, so, uh, depending on the probability, we have two regimes. Uh, there's actually more, but we'll just do these two. Uh, one of them is uh, it's, it's somewhat less than 1 over n, and the one is that it's somewhat more than 1 over n, a small amount, epsilon. Then, uh, with high probability, uh, we end up in one of two regimes. One is that uh, all the connected components are small, uh, which goes with a low probability. Uh, small here meaning logarithmic in, in the size of the graph. Uh, the 7 is about to 
it's just a number, forget about it. Uh, the epsilon square also, I don't care about very much. It's, there is some dependence on epsilon. So if, you're, if the p is really close to 1 over n, so that epsilon is small, then this statement becomes uh, weaker in that this number gets larger. And so you're saying the kinetic components are at most this size, but it's, it's larger than it was before. It's going to be here. But don't, I don't care about the dependence on epsilon, so let's just ignore the epsilon. Okay? This is just the thing in front. The main thing I care about is this log n. Okay? So uh, if the probability is small, meaning uh, at least a little bit below 1 over n by this epsilon, then the kinetic components are all size at most log n, which is pretty small. Uh, whereas, if it's a little bit above 1 over n, then uh, it contains, well, okay, they do a path here, which is, I don't care about this, uh, as, uh, just a connected component is enough. It means a connected component whose size is at least uh, linear in, the, in n. Some number times n instead of some number times log n. So, they call this a phase transition because the tra uh, because it changes rather suddenly, like the structure of the graph. Uh, I wanted to show you uh, that that suddenness. So I went and I made some animations. Um, let us start with uh, nice and small one, so I can explain what's going on. Where is that? Thirty-two to eighteen. Uh, um, okay. So in this uh, video, every square is a node in the graph. I'm just going to pause this here. Okay. So how do you visualize one of these random graphs? Well, you just Make a graph randomly, and you hope that it gets typical. Uh, so that's what I did. To understand the, the dependence on the probability, uh, you could do a couple things. One is you could say, okay, choose a whole bunch of different values of the probability that you might be that you might want to check, and then generate a new graph for each one of those probabilities. Right? Uh, that kind of sucks uh, because then there's no connection between the graphs that you chose for different probabilities, and so it's just going to change kind of randomly if you string all those pictures together. So instead, uh, I do a trick, which is to uh, I, I generate for all the edges. I generate a, a number, which is between zero and one. Right? I roll the dice for it, and I remember what the number is for that edge. Okay? And then when you set the threshold for the probability p, then you can say, okay, just throw away all the edges which uh, have numbers bigger than that. Okay? And then I'll use that graph. And then, then I can change the probability slightly as more edges appear, okay? rather than a completely different set of edges appear. All the edges go away, and new edges come in. Okay. So that's what I'm doing here. And as time goes on in this video, I'm, uh, the probability is increasing. Uh, the edges are not shown. Every block is a node, but the edges are not shown. Uh, what is shown, uh, the connected components, every connected component has its own color. Now, I only had 255 colors because uh, I'm old. And so to, to make the colors uh, not look like an angry fruit salad at the beginning here, when all the connected components are different, when the probability is very, very low, there's no edges, every node is in its own connected component, or maybe with one of its friends. Uh, rather than have it all be different colors like that, I thought, okay, I'm going to have the saturation of the color depend on the size of the connected component. Okay, so the connected component is green, but very low saturation, it's going to look kind of grayish, okay, gray or white or some pale color. And then as the connected component grows in size, because it, it connects to other things, uh, that green will become uh, more uh, vibrant, richer, okay, more higher saturation. So zero saturation is just one node, and one saturation, full saturation, would be a connected component that contains the whole, the whole graph. Okay? So you can see there's a tiny bit of color here. Right? There's some kind of purplish, but not very much. I'll, just, I'll let this run now. Uh, you can see things, the blocks changing color as they, as they connect to each other. And what is happening? It's still pretty, oh, something, oh, yeah, okay, something's happening. It's turning purple. So did that seem something to you? Kind of. uh, I didn't find that very convincing when I watched it. It's kind of nice to watch it take over the whole thing. It's kind of everywhere. Nice. That's tough. Why is purple kazoo? Okay, so uh, I didn't find that terribly convincing, so I made a bigger one. Uh, mm -hmm. Let me see. What, uh, so this one is uh, 768 by 432. Uh, the second line of this file is that. Um, that is, uh, what is that? 768. Times 432 is a few hundred, about a third of a million nodes, and uh, the number of possible edges is uh, 55 billion. So it's quite a lot. It took quite a long while for me to make my graph because I did the program in kind of a silly way. So I had to look at all those 55 billion edges and roll that slow. 
took a long time. Uh, anyway, so that uh, hopefully as the n is larger here, hopefully we get uh, a more dramatic difference between, uh, between the log n and the n of the thing here. Yeah? So let's, uh, let's have a look at that and we'll see how uh, dramatic that is. Okay, so there's also some compression artifacts in here. <laughs> Not so hot, but uh, yeah, okay, so gray, gray. So that uh, was beyond my powers before uh, I uh, came to this one watch again. I'll really run just for fun. Uh, so uh, that, is, that is the phenomenon, such as it is. Kind of nothing happens for a while, and then it becomes green. So what do I want to, uh, yeah, I guess I should prove that for you. This definitely seemed more sudden than the first one. Yeah? I, yeah. Don't, I don't know, like, I don't know if it seemed really sudden, but like, especially since like we're just like if nothing, it seems like almost nothing is happening. Yeah. And then as soon as you see a little bit of green, it's like, oh, there it is, and then it just like fades in, yeah. like right away. Okay, so that's, uh, yeah, and then it's definitely green now, right? Right. And then it's like keeps getting greener. And just white for like what felt like ages, and then it's like a little bit of green, and then it's like green. Yeah, it's like 30 or 40 seconds, I think, of, uh, of basically nothing. Okay, so that's good. So then uh, you were totally convinced by this theorem. <laughs> <laughs> Transition. Okay, so this is the paper. I will uh, explain uh, my understanding of their proof, which is uh, quite lovely, I think. Uh, I understood correctly anyway. So, uh, as they here in both cases, we run the DFS, uh, Depth First Search Algorithm, which they set up in any way which is not quite what you would imagine. Well, so here's how they do their depth search. They have uh, an initial set over here, which we'll call T. And then they have this nice little stack in the middle here, which will, oh, it looks like a U, we'll call it U. And then the stuff we're done with, which goes in S. At the beginning, all the nodes are just in a list in T. They're in a fixed order, arbitrary order, but it'll be fixed for the whole thing. So, okay. All the nodes are there. And here's how they do uh, depth first search. First, you move a uh, one node, uh, move one node to the top of the stack, U. Uh, when there's something on the stack, you loop through the things that you have left over to look at and you ask uh, the data structure, is there an edge uh, joining this node to that one? And if the answer is yes, then you push that down on the stack, or push it down on the stack, and you bring that one in, and then you resume from there. You say, I want, is there an edge from this one to the next one? And the answer is no, let's say. So you move to the next one, the next one, and you go down until you find one that there's an edge to, and then you put it on the top of the stack. If you get to the bottom of the list, and you're finally done, uh, then you pump the thing off the stack and you put it in S that you're done. Okay? Uh, so this acts like the call stack in, uh, in a traditional depth first search. We were actually implementing it on a computer. Uh, so we keep track of like, what node we're at at a particular moment and where we are in the, in the loop through the remaining nodes in T. Okay? Does that sound like depth first search to you? Yeah? Also not. Maybe not quite how you'd implement it, but. Uh, so one nice thing about so this when you find uh, when you find an edge, right. uh, do you start at the top of the list in T or after the node you just found? Ah, sorry, yeah, you start again at the top of the node. Yeah. So once you uh, once there's something at the top here, then you start over at the at the beginning and look for uh, edges from edge to that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, once that once that once bring on, once you finish that one, and bring off, then you're going to remember where you were when you had that one at the top, and yes. you can resume from there. Uh, yeah, so that you don't ask. Yeah, so one important thing about this is you never ask the same question twice. Uh, uh, you, and the only questions that you ask of the data structure are, is there an edge from node i to node j? It's the only thing you ever ask. So a cool thing about this is because you never ask the same question twice, uh, whoever it is who's answering these questions, whoever it is who's answering these questions doesn't need to remember what they told you before. 
And they could just, in fact, they can just answer randomly. Is what they will do. We have a random box over here. It just randomly answers questions, and then, and then we'll um, we happily answer <laughs> questions. Is that in the paper? Yep. Okay. It's about here. Yes or no. So the no one answers randomly yes or no. And because you, uh, and you won't notice any consistency because all the edges are independent. Okay. That's it. So uh, this is a key no. It answers with probability, answers yes with probability B, and then no with probability 1 minus D. Uh, this is the whole reason for setting up uh, death or search in this way, so that you only ask exactly that question, this yes or no question, which then can then be answered randomly by someone who doesn't remember anything that they answered before. Right. So then, uh, what they'll do is uh, change all the questions that we have about uh, the graph into questions about this algorithm, and then I'll turn into questions about the sequence of random answers that this known gives, and everything from there is just a computation in probability. Okay? Uh, a rather sometimes complicated computation, so the images were to lull you into a false sense of accessibility, and then I'll fill up this with computations later, and you'll hate me. I think I hate myself. <laughs> All right, so uh, yes, that is the algorithm. Uh, I should say a couple things about what the what a connected component looks like in this algorithm. Uh, let me start with the one that the connected component that contains the first node, uh, this one. Um, so first we have nothing in U, and then we bring the first uh, first uh, node into the stack U, and then everything that we can reach from U. We will explore before we, uh, sorry, from everything that we can reach from this node, we will explore before we take this off. We're going to explore, the, we're going to look for everything that's directly connected to, we'll find that, and everything that they're directly connected to, and everything, and we'll find all of those. Uh, and as long as there are still things for us to, that we can get to, uh, every, all those stuff will still be on the stack. And only when we get to, like, down to the bottom here and find, okay, there's nothing more to explore from there. We've seen it all. Throw it away, throw it away, throw it away, throw it away. Eventually, when we throw away this guy, we've finished the connected component entirely. And then we move on to the next connected component. We start with the, net, the first thing in T, which has not been removed from T. And we continue from there. And that will be the next connected component. So the connected components appear in this, in this algorithm in uh, what they call epochs in the paper. And that you start a connected component, you finish that connected component completely, and the stack is empty. Then you move one node on, and you do the next connected component until the stack is empty. In these phases. So, uh, okay, that's how connected components look. Let's, uh, yeah, I'm going to do the large component case first because it's, it's has more pictures. It's for the reason, I guess. Okay, so let's talk about uh, this large case. The uh, probability will be one plus the of the edges. And we're trying to show that there's a path. I won't tell the apple to show. Uh, okay, well, uh, we'll see. The connected component at least the size of least. Uh, I'm probably not going to get exactly this constant because I'm lazy and I don't want to do exactly what they did. Uh, but we'll get at least some something like epsilon squared times n times something. Times something. <laughs> constant. Let's see how this goes. Wait, uh, could you shrink it slightly so that we're not losing the right hand? Yes. I can. More. How's that? It's still losing no both. <laughs> Seven or eight characters. Fine, perfect. Oh, yeah, you, you need this character, right? Yeah, I just yeah. don't want to be able to. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, this is perfect. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, that part was hidden on purpose. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That part. That's, the, that's the secret esoteric part of the proof right there. Uh, okay, so um, for this first part, uh, the, which is actually part number two, they have a big component part. I'm going to create this uh, state space for this algorithm. It's not the complete state of the algorithm, but it's enough for us to do what we want. Uh, two axes are the sizes of T and S, sizes of these two sets of nodes. Okay. So because there are only n nodes to begin with, first of all, we know that we're, we'll stay inside this uh, triangle here. This is the line uh, S plus T, sizes of S plus T is equal to n. So we're going to stay inside this triangle, because there's only n nodes to begin with. Uh, we, we don't stay on this line necessarily because some of the time there are nodes in U. And so the sum of S and T is not always exactly n. Uh, when we begin, everything is in T, so we're here, and there's nothing in S. 
And then time goes by, we ask questions, you get yes, those no's, we gradually move things into S, and we end up over here with everything in S. Okay, so we start there and end there. Uh, notice, I mean, before we do anything else, that if, let me uh, just pick my uh, quarter or something. It really matters. Constant times in. Let me go this region here. If we ever get into this region, uh, everything is good. We're very happy. As we get into this region here, okay, so this means that uh, S plus T is less than uh, this, what is on this line, which is N over 4. Now U, besides the number of things that are in U, everything else is in U. It's not in uh, S and T, it's in U. So the size of U is uh, all the nodes in minus the ones that are in S minus the ones that are in T. And if this is less than U over 4, then this is uh, greater than N minus N quarter, which is uh, 3 quarters N. That's a linear function of A. So we're done. Right? Everything is on U, and the things that are all on U at the same time are all on the same connected component. Right? So you do one component at a time. Uh, so all these 3 quarter N nodes are in the same uh, connected component, and that is enough to prove, certainly, that there's a connected component of that size. There's not even any epsilon here. Okay? So generally, the story is we want to get closer down into this corner. If we prove that the state enters somewhere in this corner, we're happy. Uh, you can also see that by, if you, if you, let's say you take, yeah, what is the path, what is the graph, I should say, that we get if the uh, graph is totally disconnected? So there's no edges at all. Okay, so every time we ask them, one says no, no edge. So first what happens is we bring one thing over here, and then we go through no, 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 and it's nothing. So we take it off and put it in S. We get the next one, and we go no, 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 we take it off and put it in S. And this is like that. So we take one thing out of C, get a bunch of nodes, and then put it in S. Okay, so that means we go, all the way along the line to up to here. Okay, that's a totally disconnected graph, which has connected components of size one, which is not what we want. Okay, so this same along this line is bad. On the other hand, if it's completely connected, everything is connected, so we always get a yes, no matter what. Uh, then first we bring the first one on, then we get a yes, we bring the second one on, we bring the next one on, everybody comes on the stack. And then there's nothing left in T, so then things come off the stack and go into S. And so first everything moves to the U, and then everything moves to S. So everything moves to U is going here, and then everything moves to S is going there. And so, which is good for us, because that's a large connected component, that's what we want. Okay, so we want to end up down in this corner. That's what we want to prove. We will not be able to prove that we're in the same quarter region. That was just for illustration. Okay, so how are we going to prove that we don't just hug the edge here, hug the diagonal? So, uh, yeah, first observation, the first one of the most important observations is if you ask Q questions, here, I guess. Uh, if we have asked up to Q questions, less than or equal to Q questions, then uh, the product of the sizes of S and T is at most Q. This is not obvious, but the reason is uh, the way the algorithm works, there can be no edges between any node in S and any node in T. Yes, but if there were an edge, then when that node was not an S but in U, we would have found that edge and we would have brought the thing out of T and put it in U. So it never happens that there's a node from S to T. Uh, now the only way that we ever, um, yeah, we, the only things we find out with the graph is by asking the known questions. So the fact that every node in S has no edge going to any node in T, uh, we have to have found that out by asking questions. And so we have to ask at least as many questions in order to get that information. We did get that information. So. We asked at least the many questions. Q was at least this number. Okay? So, we draw this on the graph here. Here's a, this is, oh, okay, this is there. Okay? the product of x and y being t. So it says that after Q questions, or up to Q questions, we have to be in this region, which is great, right? Far away from the edge. So you're going to say, okay, well, we're done, right? So we just ask a bunch of questions. We have to stay outside here, so we have to go around this way. We can say, oh, well, then I'll take a tangent across here or something, going through this line. And I'll say, I'm in the corner. So if I'm in the corner, I get a linear thing like we had before, and we're done. And, and no, unfortunately, because this only works up to Q. You know, only if we ask up to Q questions, is this still is this true? So it means that we could just kind of put around here for a while with Q questions. And then here, we go to here with Q questions. And now on the Q plus 1th question, uh, the boundary disappears, right? And we're free to go up the other So that doesn't work. So let's all go home. Uh, okay, so we have this boundary up to Q. We need to, what we need to do is show that essentially that can't happen. We can't stay down in this corner for the whole time asking Q questions. 
Okay. So the way we're going to do that is by Okay, you know, this line here, somewhere, I don't know exactly where this is. This distance here from n to this line, this is going to be the expected number of yeses in Q questions. The graph is going to get a little bit buried. So a major uh, principle here, I'll explain in a second why I put it here on the graph instead of somewhere else, but uh, we'll see. So a major and the principle in probability is that things tend to behave like their averages, especially if you do them many times. And so here we're going to ask two questions. Uh, they're all independent, right? The norm doesn't remember anything from one answer to the next. So what we expect is that there will be P times Q yeses. Okay? Roughly. Not exactly that necessarily. Okay? And in order to get uh, more certainty, we'll get a little bit of margin around this. A little bit of margin. We call this uh, T, I guess. And so this is, you know, we'll say we're not, we're not sure that there's going to be this many expected number, but we're pretty sure it's going to be somewhere in this region here. We'll choose T later to get if this works. Uh, okay. So, uh, why did I draw it here on the graph? Because every yes question, is when we get after a you know, question answer yes, every yes answer means that we move an O from T to U. So every yes answer is a step going in that direction. It reduces the size of t. So if you put it with your expected number of yes questions, I'm pretty sure, like with high probability, if I will get this many yes answers, it means I'm going to have at least that many removals from t, and that means I'm going to be at least this far on the graph. And if I'm at least this far on the graph, then I'm not staying down on this corner. Uh, I'm going to be somewhere over here after q questions. And in fact, wherever I am after Q questions, I must have passed through this line. And if I'm passed through this line, let's see, what is this point here? Let's put it over here. So this point is going to be what? Expected number of yes questions. Expected number of yes, which we call, which is uh, P times Q, and Q questions with probability P, uh, M minus that. Yeah, that's the uh, x coordinate here, n minus p times q, uh, plus t for the threshold. That's the x coordinate. Let's put that here. Expected number of yes is that number. Minus pq plus the threshold. And then this curve, we know it's this, our uh, equality. So then this will be uh, what, q divided by the same number. Okay. That's this point here. We pass underneath it. And if we pass underneath it, then we must have had a point where we have passed through a state. A state with uh, S uh, plus T less than or equal to what it was at this point. So N minus PQ plus T plus Q divided by N minus PQ plus T. Okay? All right, so now comes a bit of a computation. I'm going to change pens because this is a little happy. So first thing is uh, we'll change to u. Uh, if s plus c is less than this, then uh, u is greater than n minus this, which is pq minus t minus u over n minus pq plus t. Uh, I am going to be kind of sloppy at this moment because I uh, forget about t. <laughs> I don't like T. Okay, so T is a terrible letter. T is a terrible letter. Did I call it something else? I call it so then we could have gotten no, rid of it. No, that's okay. You got rid of that. Yeah, that's all right. Okay. Yeah. Sorry to cause you such stress after this moment. <laughs> so, yeah, so in order to do that, uh, I'll just kind of stick somewhere, so somewhere where we'll forget it. I'm going to assume that T is much less than P times Q. That's going to be the solution there. So this is approximately equal to, I'm probably losing some constants here. Or rather, uh, I mean, I should, I should lose constants here, but I'm not doing it. I'm just saying, no, oh, that's probably the same. Okay, so I'm going to end up with a different number than them. And you may wonder, where did this number come from? Search the text. Hey. Except that I get the enter key. Space bars. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to end up with a different number than is epsilon squared over 5. Uh, and it's probably because of things like this. And because I'm just ignoring the details. Like, uh, like 
what happens to t. Let's go to t. Okay, so now here, uh, n we don't get to choose, p we don't get to choose, q we do get to choose. Right? We get to ask how many, uh, how many questions we ask. So how many questions should we ask? Well, what I want is that u should be large. So there's a lot of things on the stack, which means a large connected component. So to make u large, I want this number to be large. And I prove that it's large because it's bigger than this large thing. So I want this number to be large. So it's roughly the same. So I want this thing to be large. Okay, so you get out your calculus and you find out what q makes this largest. Okay. Optimize calculus. And I won't show you that. I will just tell you what the answer is. Q should be 1 over B times uh, N minus the square root of N over T. And form the number. So you plug that in. Uh, you do a bunch of uh, stuff, algebra in here. And what you end up with is N times something, which is this. Apparently. So I thought when I wrote this out this morning. Anyway. Okay, and then I'll skip that here. So uh, square root of one plus epsilon is roughly the same thing as uh, one plus a half epsilon squared. Uh, one over one plus something is I uh, think is small, which it is. That's roughly the same thing as one minus that thing one squared. One minus one minus that's that's uh, epsilon squared over four. So you do a computation and out comes this number. Which is not quite as it said the number that they got here. They got epsilon squared n over 5, and over 4. That's my fault. Sorry. Okay? <laughs> that's the proof. The main idea is, uh, for the larger one, uh, the crucial idea, other than this nice little trick, is, is this that uh, we expect with high probability that the uh, observed number of yeses will be very close to the average. Because we don't actually need to stay over in that corner, we just need to get over yes. to the corner at. Yes. Right. Yeah. Before, before Q. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, any time in the corner is fine, but yeah, if we're going to use the fact that we have this boundary, then we have to do it before Q. Yeah. And Q is actually pretty large. I think it's like uh, epsilon n squared over two. So you actually have to ask kind of most of your questions by some by some measures. I guess that's the large component case. Good. You're content. I believe. And when you just said your number was going to be a little bit different, I was yeah. expecting a factor of 10 or 100. <laughs> no, 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 a little bit different. Yeah. What was one? I mean, you had this dot, dot, dot algebra, and then there was an epsilon. But, like, yeah. assuming that's legit, oh, yeah, it's so, fine. Yeah, that's right. There's a, a bit of a mystery here, right? <laughs> yeah, so, of course, the epsilon is coming from the P, right? The epsilon's from the P. It's there, it's coming from the P. Yeah, but it's not. You don't want to check some of these things if you are skeptical or distrustful, which is a terrible state of the soul, by the way. You should be <laughs> open to... Okay. So the wonder of statistics. The one, yes, the wonder of... Yeah, is there any relationship to the... Uh, uh, like variance of the expected value or from the expected value and the convergence when... Oh, yeah, did I not... Uh, oh, no. Uh, yeah, you had it be point T, I think. Yeah, I, I told you an explanation about T, because I got rid of T. Yeah, OK. Uh, yes, that's a good point. So I should prove a couple things. Uh, so I, I claim that this would be, that we, uh, we'd be close to the expected number of yeses with high probability. Uh, but then I took uh, T to be quite small. Right? I needed it to be small enough so that I could throw it away in the middle of the proof. So if T's small, right, I'm saying, oh, with high probability, it'd be very, very, very close. Let's see, it's small. And now that's not so clear. How, you know, I'm now saying you have to be really, really close. Is that really true with high probability? If, you, if I have some good room there, then I say, yeah, with high probability, you're going to end up in this gigantic space. But small is a problem. So I should say something about variance. So let me, uh, earlier, I don't have notes for this, so this will be a disaster. OK. <laughs> <laughs> let me uh, go to this. You asked the thing. question off script. Yeah. <laughs> I wrote it. Yeah, I barely knew what I was asking. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this talk. It's always good to ask things about whatever the presenter is guilty about. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Except that when he says it's good, you can interpret it to mean it's very bad and you can feel bad. <laughs> okay, so uh, I need a couple of uh, inequalities to, to figure out our T here. One is Markov's inequality. Um, so uh, yeah, these inequalities are. 
uh, formal versions of the statement that I said that you expect things to be close to their average. Okay, there's a lot of these kinds of inequalities that say something about that. Uh, this is, I think, the simplest one. Probably the simplest one. Okay, so here's how it goes. Yeah, you have some random variable x, and you're and you uh, let me do this say x is positive, positive random variable. We have like number of yeses, and that's a positive number or positive zero. Uh, and then we want to compute the expected value. Okay. So the expected value, uh, how do you compute like the average or number? You just add up uh, with some of the discrete case that's not too hard about continuous things or other weirdnesses. So you take the, uh, the sum of all the possible values, let's call those xi, times their probabilities. Yeah. Probability of x is equal to xi. And so it's a weighted average of the uh, values, the possible values of the random variable, weighted by their probabilities. Okay. So uh, I'm going to throw away some of these terms. Uh, I'm going to keep only the terms where uh, the xi is larger than some number, which I will call t. Okay, so if I throw some things away and say a hey, uh, i such that uh, xi is uh, at least t. Uh, so then, um, greater than uh, xi probability of x being xi. I threw away some terms so I made the thing smaller. The missing terms are positive. That's where we're using this back here. Okay, uh, now in fact for all, all of these i, xi is bigger than t. So I don't need to write x on here. I would say, oh, I'll just take all t. Okay. I'll place the xi with t, which makes the thing smaller again, because I've assumed I've thrown away all the other xi's, ones well, that don't do that. Uh, now look what I have here. Now I have the sum over all such i, i such that xi is greater than equal to t, some of their probabilities. So that's t times the probability that uh, x is itself at least t. Now I'll rearrange and do a space uh, put it inside s, where the probability goes in s. I'll uh, keep the probability that x is at least t is less than expected value of x divided by t. And this is Markov's inequality. Okay. So, uh, first of all, we have t to be very large. It's a million times the mean. So you have a random variable. You don't know much about it, except you know its average is like 10 or something. You're saying, well, if the average is 10, it can't be very likely that it's going to be 10 million. And indeed, that's what this says. So if it averages 10, then you said that one probability that's bigger than 10 million, it'll be less than 10 over 10 million, and that's a one in a million chance. Okay. So, okay, that's great. Uh, when t is large, it tells you something useful. Uh, when t is small, it doesn't tell you very much. Like if you say t is half of the expected value, then you don't get any information at all, unfortunately. So then you say, what's the probability that x is bigger than half of this average? And here you put in the half of the expected value, the expected values cancel. The half on the bottom goes upstairs and becomes two. So it's so probably less than two. But yeah, that's true, but it's not terribly useful. <laughs> we knew that already, right? It's less than one. Uh, so, so you smack the person who applied Markov's inequality that way, and you wait, no, you don't, because you're not. No. Uh, okay, so that's Markov's inequality. This is a uh, most fundamental uh, and simplest version of the statement that things tend to be close to their averages. Yeah, this one, all, really all that this one says is that things are not much larger than their averages. And that'll be uh, that'll help me for the moment. Okay, so I'm going to erase Markov's inequality now. So, yeah, okay. so the follow up to uh, Markov that we need is Chebyshev. Chebyshev's inequality. Uh, yeah, so this one is similar. We'll start with uh, expected value. Uh, oh, what do I want to do? Sorry. Yeah, probability that. Uh, x differs from its average by more than t. Crash course to probability. Yes. Okay, so a distance between x and its average, more than t, what is the probability of that? They're far away, far away from your average. Uh, that should be small, again, by our theory, right? We're, we're close to the average here. So uh, we'll do this. We'll say this is, this is our new x here. It is a positive number, because I took absolute value. It's part of me. Um, <laughs> I will replace the, uh, actually I will replace the numbers, because everything is positive, I can just replace them with their squares, and I will not impair the, uh, let's assume t is positive also, not negative. Uh, the square root of I'll keep the inequality the same. Now, I'll say this is x, okay, this will do the same, we'll say this is x. Okay, this positive number is x. We'll do this again, and mark off, and we'll get, uh, what, the expected value of this thing, 
x minus x x squared over uh, t squared. And this thing you might recognize as variance, as n, all the variance of x divided by t squared. Okay. So, uh, this is in some ways a little bit better than Markov's inequality because you get over t squared instead of over t. So, when t gets large, and this is a smaller number generally because it has a slope t squared instead of over t. So, it gives a slightly stronger result on the decay of the probabilities as t gets large. Unfortunately, you have to assume that the variance is a finite number, which is not always the case with random variables because some of them are rude and they don't have finite variance. Actually, some of them are very rude and they don't even have finite mean, but uh, we don't speak about those. All right, so this is Chebyshev's inequality. Uh, we're going to use this with, in this situation. So I have this random variable, which is the number of yeses. I'm going to call that x. And, uh, the mean you can compute. Uh, I'm not going to compute it. The variance you can compute also, and I'm not going to compute that. It turns out that the variance of this random variable of expected number of yeses, or the number of yeses, the variance of the number of yeses from known in uh, Q questions, Q questions is uh, Q times P times 1 minus P. If you want to check this, uh, you can Google binomial distribution. That's what the name of this is, the sum number. Uh, so, what I want for current purposes is what? Uh, I want that this should be close to zero. Because I'll say the probability that I'm further away than t is small. And that will be what? That's the, the key factor of the with high probability thing. So, to get that, I need t squared to be quite a bit uh, larger than this bar x, which is this. So, as I need uh, t squared much larger than qp times 1 minus b. Uh, Something has gone horribly wrong. Uh, or has it? Hmm. Hmm. Oh, no, it's okay. Yeah, okay. Forget about this one minus b. Uh, p is kind of small. It's like uh, 1 plus epsilon over n. It's relatively small. It'll probably be it'll close enough to say this. But I could just ignore the little minus p and say this is qp. And so I want t squared to be bigger than p times q. Oh, maybe a little bigger to get this one minus. Um, uh, great, so the yeah, t should be smaller than pq, but t squared should be larger. So this is easy. We'll take t like uh, pq to the power of like 2 thirds or something. And then it's smaller than pq, but you square it to get that number to the 4 thirds, so it's bigger than pq. So everything will be okay. So there are such t. We can choose a set of all the requirements we need to make this proof go through. Thanks, Mike, to ask me that. That's double one. Usually that's like you know, three classes at least. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but they would also do it more carefully. So. <laughs> okay, so uh, so that's the large component thing. The major idea is so yeah, one is this trick of cutting away a large part of the state space. And second is this business about uh, the number of yeses be close to the average. What time is it? It's six minutes before eight. Okay, so I have six minutes to do the other half of the brief. Take ten minutes or something. Okay. Uh, uh, okay, let me uh, quickly do the, the version of the uh, sun went down when I was talking. You can have eight minutes if you need. <laughs> I wouldn't rather worry about it. Your dog is more interesting than my dog. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, it's only because your dog hasn't happened yet. Uh, okay, so, right, so now we, that's, the, that's the part where the component is going to be large. It's this. Now we're going to go with the uh, case where the connected component is small, and we go with the number that's not again. Again, I'll not get the 7, I'll get something a little different than the 7. I don't think it's 6. That's <laughs> no, not 8 either, I forget what it is. <laughs> Oh, okay, it's a lot. We'll discover it together. Yes, <laughs> okay, it's a journey into numbers. Okay, uh, we won't need this fact anymore, we won't need these facts anymore. Chevy Shadow, we don't need. We don't need Markov, so we'll leave the Markov chill here in the S. Don't need any of this. Don't need this. I don't think we need that number, but it was a cheap one, so we'll leave it. <laughs> <laughs> Store to 
してくるわけね。そうそう。So the small thing,、uh, probability is one minus epsilon now over n. That's in case number one there.、Uh, let us consider. Okay, yeah. So we need to pursue this little. I don't know. This is a little awkward way to do it, but、uh, I'm charged, so we're gonna do that. Okay, so if、uh, k is some number that I'm gonna choose later, if we do k times n consecutive questions to our norm,、uh, we're gonna have among them less than k yeses. Okay, then、uh, the stack will be reduced. So what I mean is, you're when you start. You only ever ask a question when you've got something on the stack, right? You're asking about the edge, whether there's an edge from the top thing on the stack to something in T. So you've got something on the stack. If you ask k n questions from that point, starting from that point where you've got something on the stack, and among those k n questions, there's less than k yeses, then at the end of that, you're going to have a smaller stack than you did when you started. Why is that? That's because if you have、uh, k less than k yeses, yes, a yes question is the only way you add something to the stack. Or yes, answer is the only way you add something to the stack.、Okay? So this means less than k、uh, nodes added to stack. And if you have、uh, less than k of them, less than k, so then you have at least、uh, k times n minus one nodes、okay? to make up the rest of your question. That's what you think of questions. Now n minus one nodes is the Right, let me put it this way: n minus one questions is all the questions you ever ask about a particular node at most.、Right? You got one node here, there's n minus one left on t, and you ask all these things. That's all you ask. So we get n minus one nodes. Or let me put it a different way: something on the top of the stack can only experience n minus one nodes before you take it off the stack. So if you have k n minus one nodes, then that means at least k、uh, nodes removed. So you added fewer than k. You had one there to begin with, maybe, but then you took away more than k. So you reduced the total numbers of things on the stack. The stack is small. All right. So we、uh, recall this thing we said about、uh, epochs. The kinetic components. You get the first thing in the kinetic components, and then you do a bunch of stuff, and then the stack is empty at the end. Okay. So if you have,、um, yeah. So then you get the kinetic component. The first node from it comes onto the comes onto the, comes onto the stack. If at that point the next k n questions have fewer than k yeses in them, then you will reduce the stack, which means you empty it. And if you empty it, that means you're done with that connected component. And so if、uh, first k n questions、uh, for a component have less than k yes,、uh, that component is of size less than k. Uh, less than or equal to k, because you empty the stack according to this. Okay. So flip that around. Say if you have a component, kind of positive. If、uh, there is a component, if there exists a component of size more than k, then there are、uh, yeah, there are some k n questions that you ask. Consecutive questions. Questions with at least k yeses. Let me turn on the lights. Keep yourself in mind. Other one. Oh, never mind. No, the other six didn't get success. Okay, so this、uh, this is what I need. And、so if there's a component of size k, there are some k and consecutive questions that have at least k yeses among them. So I'm going to show us that that's not very likely. Or I can pick k, so if that's not very likely, and then when I pick k to do that, it'll be this k. It'll be that number. Let's log in with some epsilons in it.、Okay? So I'll say that、uh, this thing is unlikely, which means it's very unlikely that there exists a component of size bigger than that. By the way, with high probability, all components are small. Okay, so that's.、Uh, Yeah, so this is the part where I get to fill up the board, and my board is already kind of full. Ah, <laughs>、uh, really?
Maybe I don't even need depth for search anymore. I haven't told you that. No more questions about depth for search. Yeah. Yeah. It's fine. <laughs> I believe the gnome because he's on my side. Okay, so uh, probability. What do we want? Does the probability that there is a component of large size? Component of size. Uh, at least k, greater than, say greater than k. Uh, these things don't matter very much. These are the same. Okay, so according to this, if there's a component of size k, then there are such questions. So the probability has to be less. Uh, there are some. There is, let me put it this way. There is a run of k n questions. Yes, a run of k n questions with uh, at least k s's. So, how many ones are there? Uh, there could be a lot. We don't know exactly. I'm going to overestimate it by quite a lot. Uh, I can be kind of casual. I'm kind of sure that this is small, right? So if I make this thing big, I'm not being very efficient, but I'm not destroying my result time. So it's going to be casual. There are at least, there's like n squared chances-ish that, uh, that you have it such a one. Starting from the first node being on the graph, to the second, uh, the first question, the second question, you asked, they're mostly n squared over two uh, questions because that's how many edges there could be uh, in the worst case. So uh, n squared chances of one of these happening, so a fixed or given run uh, is kn questions, period, get at least k guesses. And what I want to be, I'm saying, we only get kn questions for this probability, and k of them have to be yes. Okay, so what's the probability of that? Here I will set up a little model. Small little model. Uh, so all the answers of the norm are, uh, we'll call them x. So norm's answers. This one is 1 minus p, this is uh, And the number of yeses is the sum of the uh, xi. You started out so good and then you changed to this dot 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 thing. <laughs> I like dots. <laughs> dots are my friends. It's the whiteboard, whiteboard version of hand waving. <laughs> I already drew like approximately equal to, so I mean we're on the dark side, so <laughs> sorry. Uh, if you like, you can interpret this as the uh, Haskell notation for uh, lists, and where you specify the yeah. comma b dot dot c, and then it's e from front two or whatever it is, mm -hmm. and then I mean the same thing by this that they mean by that. <laughs> All right, so uh, yeah, okay, fine. So we're good. Right. Some Okay. Yeah. Okay. See, way better. <laughs> All right. So this thing is at n squared times the probability that this uh, sum of x i is at least k. Uh, we just need a bad number so we can call it t again. Uh, we're going to multiply by t in here. You notice that this before I go into further. So this is all like Markov's inequality, which I erased, so you can't remember it. But, uh, we're not going to be able to use markers and call it the directly. I mean, we could, but it would not give us the result that we want. And we're going to, so we're going to do a trick, very sneaky little trick, due to a guy named Chernoff. Uh, as we were just talking about today, he did. This is also the guy responsible for Chernoff faces. And it's a statistical visualization technique where you show the data points using little faces. And some of the variables in your data are done by expressions on the face. It's like how big its forehead is or something, and how, big, how much it's smiling. These are all different variables. So it's supposed to be like, is it revolved to look at faces? Like, you should just be able to glance uh, at a gigantic graph with 100 faces on it and spot outliers and just get a feeling for that. It's nonsense, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I just have a problem with people or something. Okay, anyway, so we both want to 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 do the setup the channel trick, which will come in a minute. I've never seen the other T as greater than equal to zero, so I didn't destroy my equality. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, next, I'm anticipating in the future, uh, I'm going to use the fact that these texts are independent. I didn't say it, but they are, because the number doesn't remember anything. Uh, they're independent, but uh, what independent means is that like, the uh, expectation of the product of two of these will be the same as the expectation of the product of the expectations. Yeah? The product. Okay, but I don't have a product, I have a sum, so I just give up. Uh, no, I don't give up. I know how to turn products into sums, I exponentially give up. E to the T sum X I greater than E to the T K. Okay. Now we use Markov's inequality. So we get N squared divided by that number, uh, the expectation of this, uh, this number which is positive because it's E to the something, yeah, divided by this thing, E to the T K. Okay. Uh, sum. Sum. So we like that. All right, now let's break up the, the do the trick here. So I get n squared. This is expectation of product of e to the t x i uh, x i because it's exponents. So I know you k. Expectation of product is product of expectation because they're independent. So product of expectations of e to the t x i all divided by u of t k. Uh, now all these are the same. These x i's. Okay. I mean they're all they're independent samples, so they could have different values at any given moment. But it doesn't matter here because they take expectations of. So since they all have the same distribution, this is a non answering multiple times, uh, it doesn't matter which of these, uh, uh, there's no difference between all these different expectations, they're all the same. So this is really just a thing to the power of how we're making out, which is, uh, I'll just say x1 to the power of kn, k, kn, k, n, k, k, values of the thing, right? Weighted by their probabilities. So probability P, e to the t times 1, that's this case, and then this. So plus 1 minus P, e to the t times 0, all to the nk divided by e to the tk. Okay. Okay. Uh, simplify this is 1, that's e to the t, you rearrange in here, squared, uh, 1 times 1 is 1, Should I, I'll say that again, 1 times 1 is 1, okay. Do you have like a proof for that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, okay. Which number system? <laughs> but why, why is, oh, why is any one ring, I think? One? <laughs> why is 1 minus P 1? 1 times 1 is 1. What? Why is 1 minus P he hasn't got into the Oh, yeah, I haven't done everything yet. Oh, yeah, so okay. this is, this is this thing that's good. Never mind. Yeah, yeah, there's a P yeah. left, and a P has E over T, Look, the P has a minus 1. <laughs> you know what, I can change this now. I should change it one time ago, but do the minus. All right. How are we doing? We're doing pretty well. Uh, okay, uh, this is uh, 1 minus something, or 1 plus something. And you may recall there's this lovely little inequality about the uh, x and 1 plus x, or e to the x and 1 plus x. 1 plus x is one of the tangents to the graph of e to the x. So this thing here is a less than e to the thing, e, e to the t minus 1, e to the minus dk. Okay, so the t's are coming together, that's the point. Let me actually rewrite that a little bit differently. e to the this thing up here. Okay, now we are cooking with gas in the field. All right, uh, this is probably the there's a component of the smaller size. Is down to above like this. All I need is for this to be close to zero. If this to be close to zero, I need something to defeat this. This is pretty big, so this needs to defeat that. So I need this to be small. So I need this thing up top here to be small. Uh, so I minimize it because I get to choose t to be whatever I want. Because I just I just stuck in t before, and it's up to me. Because it's giving me enough flexibility so that at this moment I can do what I want. As long as it's bigger than zero. As long as it's bigger than zero. <laughs> so it's. Uh, so, <laughs> so you uh, get up to calculus again, and calculus now, you optimize for t, or optimize t, it comes up to be uh, apparently, uh, it's negative log 1 minus epsilon.
this one. Because that's smaller than one, uh, one, so the log is negative, so the negative here makes a positive. Okay. Uh, so you plug that in and you do approximately around. Uh, he goes dot 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 approximately. Dot dot approximately. Um, can I see the log? Get to the, uh, it was an equality, but it's not a total square. Yeah. Yeah. E to the negative epsilon squared k. Yeah, exercise. <laughs> okay, so now we're almost done. K, again, we get to choose. We just want this thing to be small, to be close to zero. So this should be uh, mighty enough to destroy the n squared. And so we will take, uh, here. nobody's using this space right now. So take k to be, oh, uh, I'll kill the epsilon first. I divide my epsilon squared. I'll put a log n in. Then I'll get e to the log n, that'll give me n to some power. And I want the power to be enough to destroy that 2, so I'll take it to be 3. Okay, so then the probability of this, blah, 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 is less than equal to n squared, e to the, you know, plug that in, cancel the epsilon squared, then n to the negative 3, which is 1 over n which goes to zero, as it goes to infinity, which is what we said we meant by with high probability. Right, so if you take k to be this, and we plug k back in here, and said the probability that there is a component of size bigger than this is small, close to zero. Uh, it's not quite the same number. It's hugely different from the number that they gave. Five. This is right second. Uh, number was five? Was it? Seven. Seven. There was a seven and a five. Okay. Seven. seven. I got a three. So, sorry. Uh, yeah, so I get a slightly bigger result. Again, because of all these, because I'm being sloppy and ignoring details. And they're pretty smart. I'm not so smart. Uh, so that's the proof. And uh, again, so the only real, uh, there's a lot of kind of tricks in this part of the proof, especially the substantiation trick. It's called the turn off uh, trick or turn off down. But really, the inequality at work is Markov's again, which is about the concentration of things around their averages. And that really is the whole, the whole argument is this things concentrate around their averages when you do them a lot. Uh, and everything else comes from that. Uh, oh, I forgot to say my intuitive remark on this. This is not very intuitive, but we'll do it anyway. I'll say it right again. So, the, uh, yeah, the actual expected value here of, the, of, the, of this number. Expected value of this thing, the sum of the xi's, uh, the sum of expectations, and they're all the same, so this is just uh, kn times the expectation of one of them, the x1, we'll do this in a different color, so you can tell that it's in the inverse. Uh, this is p, p times kn, the expectation of something that looks like this. It's zero single times, that doesn't matter, and then it's probably p is one, p times one is p. Uh, n times p is 1 minus epsilon in this case. That was our guiding assumption from the beginning. So the expected value of this is a little bit less than k. And that essentially is the whole argument. We just need to be precise about how, how we guarantee that it's really separated away from k. Uh, and the whole argument here is, is exactly that. The probability shouldn't be this big. It should be nothing. It should be like 1 minus epsilon times k. We're close to that. Questions? I'm trying to imagine what the function of the, like the minimum path of at least n nodes looks like for as you increase. P. So I'm imagining right. like, how does the function question. change as you increase n? Presumably uh, with P, uh, yeah, you know, so going from 0 to 1 sort of continues. That's not fixed, right? And yeah. 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 So let's fix that one. Okay, that's a good question. One of the things is it's kind of annoying because the threshold value would be 1 over n, that depends on n. So you're changing n, the threshold is going to be close and close to 0, which kind of distracts. So what we should, should do really is not consider p, uh, but consider p times n in our graph. And so when we draw this graph, we draw the, uh, I mean, 
events. Yeah, so what we're drawing here on this graph, we're drawing p times n. Important numbers are zero, one, and two, and that's what we get. So what this is saying is that if you're a little bit less, a little bit more, everything, something happens in here. Before that, it's small, log n, and after that, it's big, not n, roughly speaking. Yeah. And then in the middle, presumably, does something. Um, so as if you keep if you increase n here, uh, but keep p uh, proportional to n in the same way, or inversely proportional to n, and the lack in this graph is uh, the log n will get smaller, and the n will get bigger, and this will stretch out, and it will become more and more abrupt, which is why I needed to do a big graph to show you the, yeah, yeah, yeah. to try to get the abruptness on this. This is what I was trying to picture the whole time. Like, you mean I should have this in the beginning? Sorry. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I should have drawn this in the beginning. But like on one side of the graph, it looks like, what, you know, it looks like a certain function, on yeah. the other, it looks like another function. Something else. Yeah, it's quite mysterious. You know, like kind of turning it up. Is it continuous? Uh, uh, no, it has to be discrete. Uh, right. Because it's like a number of nodes and then it has to jump back. Uh, and of course, it's probabilistic. So it depends on how you roll the dice this particular time, on this particular occasion. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, so you want to know like kind of the typical jump size in some sense, is small. Be something like continuity. Uh, yeah, that would make sense. I mean, as we're increasing in, we get um, uh, and, and that's it. That's probably not true. Yeah, I don't <laughs> know if you can say anything useful about the rate of its increase. Yeah. I guess if you draw the expectation, I guess that would be pretty reasonable. There is a pseudo cause inequality, but I believe there's not this pseudo cause. The pseudo cause inequality is like from the 30s or something. 40s, maybe. I don't remember exactly. Uh, I could easily be wrong by a couple of decades there. So I think there's a family of Russian mathematicians called Tsudko, and this is one of the younger ones. Uh, Kriblevich, uh, it's on archive. Uh, there's the arrow up in the top corner there, which I uh, assume you have memorized. Uh, the original result, though, was proved by Erdish, Weirdo Erdish, famous. Weirdo in mathematics, and uh, Remy was another uh, important uh, mathematic, uh, mathematician of longer uh, who did a lot of work with Irish. They proved this, back, uh, this, this thing about the phase transition in the 50s, I think, late 50s. Uh, and actually, they proved a little bit more just to add to this picture. So you say, okay, that's what happens less than one plus epsilon, bigger than one plus epsilon. What happens in the middle? Turns out if you, if you actually add one or converge to one and one, when you're in the middle, you're at n to the two thirds. Of course. I mean, no, that's what you expect, right? <laughs> so there's actually two jumps. One from log n to n to two thirds, and one from n to two thirds to n. I don't know if you can prove this using the result using the methods that are in this paper. Uh, they don't mention it. And apparently Erich and Manny's original result had both of these transitions. So this this paper that you were working off of was yes. just another way to prove what they had already proven? Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah Sim that's a, that's a simple, simple proof. Right. Right. Yeah. Because it uses help for search. <laughs> and, yeah. And the no. So uh, now I guess we'll take a very brief break because I'm over time, hugely over time. And uh, then Stephen will tell us about the rest. <laughs>